This meeting is being recorded. Thank you all so much for coming and welcome Dr. Peter Nack for joining us from American University and the School of International Service. Dr. Nack is an adjunct uh, uh, professor of lecturer at SIS. He also serves as a research fellow at the Global Economic uh, Governance Program at the University of Oxford and at uh, the Center of Sustainable Finance at SOAS London. His research co concentrates on the international political economy of finance, in particular, financial inclusion, green digital finance, technology, and regulation. Dr. Nack's regional focus is on political economy of financial development in China. Thank you so much for joining us, and you could take it away. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and uh, good to meet you, everyone. Uh, it's great to see so many people uh, awake and, you know, going to Zoom on a Saturday morning, evening, uh, whatever it is in, in your time zone. Uh, and I'm happy to share uh, the next hour with you talking a little bit uh, about global economic governance. Uh, before we get started, my apologies. Um, my neighbors have decided today to whip out a chainsaw and take down the tree in their backyard. So if there is like massive, and there's nothing I can do about it, you know, like, so if there is like some noise, it is the chainsaw next door. So I apologize for that. It, it might happen. Right now, it looks like they're done with the chainsawing and now they're just chopping, but you never know. It might, it might come back anytime. All right, uh, that said, uh, I'm, I'm very grateful for the chance to, to chat with you. Uh, and talk a little bit about um, this stuff that I've been interested in for the last 10 years that I wrote my master's thesis on, my dissertation, and that is now the stuff of, of my research and of my, <clears throat> my first book uh, that hopefully will see the light of the day uh, this year. Um, and uh, what I would like to uh, share with you, I want to drill down on, on a very specific organization of um, uh, global economic governance, and that is the G20. Uh, and before we get started with this, I would love to just like check in with you and uh, with Ryan's help, um, submit a poll to you. Uh, and that the question is, do you know the G20? Do you know who they are and what they're doing? So if you can please go to menti.com, use that code, and just give me a quick sense of like, yes, I know what the G20 is, or no, I've never heard of it. That'll be awesome. Let's take three, four minutes and see how this works. Yeah. Menti is fascinating. It's a little bit like the um, European Song Contest, where it, like the votes come in in real time, and then you see who wins. And for everyone here, just type in menti.com and use the code 7356818. It's just a yes or no question, and we'll have um, we'll have another check-in after that. Great. Okay. I think this is a good uh, indication. I think about two thirds of you have answered the question. Um, so I think, I think we have a good idea. So 50-50, I'd say 50-50. Half of you have heard of the G20, know what they're doing, and half of you haven't. Great. OK, let's start with that. That's good. Thank you, Ryan. Should we go to the next question? Or... Uh, no, no, I'll come back to the next question in about five minutes or so. That, that's OK. So if you want to uh, stop the screen sharing, and then I could start sharing my screen. Shall we do that? Let's 
Okay, can you see this slide? Uh, yeah, okay. we can see it. Brilliant. Okay, let's get started. Uh, so I want to talk today uh, about uh, state and network and how they respond and what it means uh, for the rules of global finance. And I want to talk about the G20 and the FSB, the G20, which half of you are familiar with, but the FSB will find out how many, uh, maybe fewer. Um, I, <coughs> I teach uh, at American University. Uh, part of like my lecture today is is what I'm doing with my uh, graduate students. I'm teaching a, a master's uh, level class on global economic governance. So you'll see some of that uh, content here. Um, and um, yeah, um, basically show you a little bit uh, uh, of what I've been interested in, what, why I care, uh, and you know maybe how this resonates with, with your life and what you might be uh, finding interesting in this. Um, so to get started, let's see. Um, so a few key terms as we get started. Um, one of them is uh, global economic governance, right? What I'm interested in is global economic governance. And as you can see, this word governance is not a word that, that we hear very often. It goes beyond government. Um, so it looks at global governance, the way um, the market is being uh, the rules that govern how market actors act. So anyone who is a market actor, and that could be private or public institutions, they are um, adjusting their behavior based on rules of the game. Who sets those rules of the game? This is what I'm interested in. Uh, within a country, within any nation state, that is often the government. Um, but at the global level, there is plenty of rules uh, that matter that are not set by any individual government, uh, but by a system that is wider than any given government. And this is when it gets interesting for me. That is what I'm looking at. Um, specifically, I look at financial regulation. So not the rules that govern trade or the rules that govern production uh, of anything, but specifically at financial services. What are the rules that banks, that in asset, investment companies uh, that payment providers, et cetera, are subjected to and, and who made those rules, right? Who set those rules of finance? How are they being set? What is the process? Who is involved? What does it mean? Um, the uh, a key kind of organization that is involved in setting the rules for global finance are so-called standard setting bodies, SSB. Uh, you might not have heard of any of these, uh, which is, you know, interesting that these like very powerful organizations are not on the radar of a lot of people. I didn't hear about them until I was, I don't know, 25 or so when once I started getting deeper into uh, economics and, and finance. That was when I heard of them. Uh, one of these standard setting bodies, for example, is the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Uh, if you have never heard of this, you will be forgiven uh, that you have that in common with 90% of humanity easily. Um, so these are uh, not very famous, but very powerful organizations uh, where the members, and we talk about who is a member and who is not, set the rules of finance. Uh, and these things happen uh, with a representative from different countries being at the table. So you can think of it as a form of diplomacy. There is a way in which um, uh, representatives from financial regulators from different uh, countries work together or do not work together uh, to set rules for finance that apply to uh, financial markets on, on, uh, in different countries. So it's really a kind of diplomacy, not the kind of diplomacy that you see in the news uh, where you know the foreign minister visits and you know signs an agreement or a memorandum of understanding. This is uh, a more technical kind of diplomacy. Uh, this is, a, you know, uh, very specifically on, for example, rules for banking or on rules for stock markets, but it is nevertheless a form of regulatory diplomacy. So how does this work? How does regulatory diplomacy work? These are kind of uh, some of the key terms that, that I'll be uh, explaining a little bit more. Um, so um, from just your, your faces uh, in, you know, like a first impression on Zoom, my impression is that 
all of you were alive uh, when the Pittsburgh summit in 2009 happened, but not a lot of you are old enough to remember. Uh, that is that is my hunch. You know, like uh, please uh, raise your raise your hands or, or give me a, shoot me a message if, if I'm totally wrong here. Um, and you might remember some of these people if you look at uh, at uh, the people that were involved in Pittsburgh. Uh, at the summit in 2009, many of them are not in government. Most of them are not in government anymore. Although, if you look at the first, in the first row, you see uh, Lula uh, back in, in those days, who might become uh, the next president of Brazil later this year. We'll we'll see. That is to be found out. But so uh, I'm I'm using this this picture to show you that this was a moment in history when leaders from the G20 and the G20 is uh, the group of 20. It is the group of 20 nations. In fact, it's 19 nations in the European Union, uh, but it is the leaders of these 20 uh, nations who got together uh, to fix the global financial crisis. As many of you will remember some way or another, um, in uh, 2009, uh, the financial system in the US and in the UK collapsed with massive repercussions for the rest of the world. Um, millions of people lost their jobs, um, trillions of, of wealth was destroyed within the course of a year, uh, the entire world sank into recession, unemployment jumped, um, some people, uh, particularly in the US, had to leave their homes and live in tents in public squares uh, for a while. And this is actually, I used to live in, in Argentina, That's just, this is where I, I studied and where, where I did my master's. And I came to the US for my PhD in 2009. So it was quite a dire moment, you know, to arrive in like first world country, uh, you know, LA, one of the richest famous cities on earth and see tent cities, you know, the public squares were full uh, of tents with homeless people um, and more than before, because there were also a lot of homeless people, people who had lived in houses before, but who couldn't afford to pay their mortgage anymore and were kicked out of their houses. So that was my first impression, you know, of, of moving to LA back in 2009. And I was like, okay, I want to find out what's going on here. And back in 2009, the, these leaders that you see here uh, got together and said, okay, we're going to change the rules of global finance to make sure that something like that, what just happened to us is not going to happen again. We're going to rein in uh, bankers and uh, speculators and anyone involved in the financial system to make sure they cannot um, ruin the lives of ordinary people who know nothing about the exotic financial products that have caused uh, this crisis. Um, so my research uh, that I've done uh, looks at the promises that these uh, uh, global leaders of the G20 made and uh, the reality of its implementation. Did they keep their promises? Uh, what worked and what hasn't worked? That's what I've been looking at. And this is, this is what my book is about. And what, I, uh, what I've looked at is uh, to what extent things have moved forward. And I'm not gonna dive, as you can see here, now, like pretty quickly, we get into very technical language, right? Like it is about Basel III, which is a global banking standard, OTC derivatives, which is an exotic pro financial product uh, that was not subject to any rules. And that was a big reason for uh, the financial chaos uh, of 2009. And then also uh, banking resolution, how to let a bank fail without having taxpayers pay for it. Right? So these are uh, some of the uh, policy areas that were really important. And there's a bunch of even more technical uh, elements to this that uh, G20 leaders have decided we need to work on this. And they have set rules for this, but not everyone has implemented them. So as you can see here, the progress in financial reform, and this is six years after they said they were gonna do it, is mixed. Some areas have really moved forward in all 24 jurisdictions. So um, what we'll see in, in the FSB, it's a little bit more than 20. There's, uh, you have the G20, which is the biggest economies, but you also have the likes of Switzerland and Singapore um, uh, present in the place. So all, of those 24, um, some of them, some of these rules have really been implemented by everyone. And there's some rules that have not been implemented by anyone, right? That are just kind of uh, left um, 
as a promise and that they have not turned into reality. And my question is why? Why is that the case? Why have G20 leaders met some of their promises and not others? Um, and in order uh, to uh, find out, what I've done is um, what is called a, a systematic process analysis. Um, so to give you an idea, I studied, I did a master's in economics and a PhD in international relations, which is an element of um, political science. That is one subfield of political science. So I really tried to combine economics and politics, money and power, and where they go together, because I think those are the two things that move the world. Fortunately or unfortunately, you know, and I'm not making a judgment if that's a good thing, but I, I found uh, having lived in, in different places that uh, where money meets power, things get interesting. So what I've done is I've looked at uh, archival data, plenty of documents. I've read uh, all the documents of the, of the G20 and uh, the organizations that are members of it. And I've interviewed uh, about 100 people that are involved in this. Uh, this, these are people that are financial regulators, um, people that were involved in the G20 process, diplomats, central bankers, etc. And I had the chance, you know, this, this was a, I was, I was lucky and blessed to have, um, I applied to a, a lots of grants and, and got some funding uh, in order to able to uh, travel to different places. I was able to interview people in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in Sao Paulo, um, in Brazil, uh, all, all across Europe, um, and uh, I lived in, in China for a year in Beijing. I went to Singapore to talk to people, Hong Kong. Uh, I talked to people at the RBI, the, the Reserve Bank of India, um, and uh, go to the US too. So it's been a long time uh, of just meeting with people, asking them how they feel about a certain area and what is their perspective is on this. And from all of this, you know, wealth of information, I try to pull it together and make sense of it. Um, so uh, the FSB is, is what I've been interested in. And you can see this here already down here at the bottom, you see FSB. So let me, um, let's see how I can stop screen share. Uh, Ryan, are you able to screen share on top of the yeah. screen share or do I? Oh, no, I can't. Okay, so let me unshare, stop sharing. Okay, all right, and uh, as the chainsaw is, can you hear the chainsaw? It's a real chainsaw. Yeah. Like, yes, it's, isn't that can. amazing? I've never heard a chainsaw in my backyard. Today is the day they decided to take the chainsaw. <laughs> okay, give me one moment. So unlike, unless they decide to take down another tree or the house, hopefully they will be done with this soon. But here's, here's the second question. Have you heard of the Financial Stability Board? Let's do a quick poll on that. And to everyone here is on the same code, 7356818. Yeah, okay, 30 to 4, that's pretty clear. Right, and you see the difference. You see the difference in, in the G20. Uh, about half of you have heard of it, half of you hasn't. Hardly anyone. I mean, it's amazing that four people have heard of the Financial Stability Board. That is more than I expected, but most of you have never heard of this organization, and that's pretty interesting. Thank you, Ryan. Great. Okay, so let me share my screen again. Are we back? Is it working? Yeah, it is. Okay, perfect. This is the FSB. This is what it looks like. Uh, so it is a government network 
And uh, it is an organization that was created in 2009, so it's pretty new. Um, and uh, it uh, meets uh, in Basel, which is in northern Switzerland, a really nice town, uh, very quaint. And um, it is, um, you see here who is a member. So 24 countries or jurisdictions are members. That is the G7, the BRICS, uh, other G20 countries. And now you see all the G20 countries. So you see now who is at the table and then some others, the Netherlands, uh, for reasons that are not quite clear, Spain, um, who's always good at, at getting their government invited to the G20. They were not part of the G20, but they're like their permanent guests, uh, Switzerland, Hong Kong, and Singapore. I'm calling this uh, jurisdictions, not countries, because Hong Kong and China are two different jurisdictions. And from a financial perspective, that makes a lot of sense. They might be the same country, but the Hong Kong financial system is very different from the Chinese financial system. So they're really, they're different regulators, different central banks, and that's why they come as two different, uh, very different players. Uh, there's also international organizations that are members, Bank of International Settlement, the European Central Bank, the Commission, and then the IMF and the World Bank and the OECD. And then some of the international standard, standard setting bodies. Uh, I've already mentioned the Basel Committee. There's one for insurance, one for securities, one for accounting, and two more. So these are rather obscure, you know, uh, organizations that really hardly anyone has heard about. And the G20 has created the FSB to set the rules of global finance. So uh, when G20 leaders said, we want the global financial system to be safe and a crisis like the one we've experienced never to happen again, the FSB is in charge of that. The, the G20 doesn't do that. They have outsourced that work to the FSB. And, you know, how can it be that something that important is so unknown? That is, it's pretty fascinating to see, right? Like, we all know what the IMF is. We all know what the World Bank is. We've all heard of the WTO, NATO, you know, all these big international organizations. Everyone knows of them. How come hardly anyone has ever heard of the FSB? Um, but yet our, like, the safety of our assets and our prosperity and our jobs to some extent depend on what we're doing. In there. And so my book is, is trying to, to shed some light on this. And, you know, I've, 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 I went there, I talked to a, a couple of people, I went there twice uh, to interview people. And I've read every single document they've, they've published um, over the course of my research. And I even found a, a conspiracy theory about the FSB. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, you know, promoting this book, but uh, there's a book that's called, uh, that I found in a random bookshop. Uh, that is about uh, the FSB. So you know that an organization has made it if a, if a uh, conspiracy theory is published about it. So some people know about the FSB. And I've looked at why, what, what they're doing. Um, and here's something um, that is a kind of an important element of how, how we can understand global economic governance. Uh, the UN and all of its agencies, you know, have 190 members. Uh, the IMF and the World Bank do too. These are universal organizations. The WTO, which is in charge of trade, has 140 or 50 something members, so almost universal. The FSB has 24. So this is not an organization that incorporates everyone, that is a very selective and small group of a few nations. Um, the biggest and most advanced nations that set the rules here. Everyone else is not invited, and this, these are closed uh, door negotiations. So if you are not part of that club, you don't get to make the rules. You don't get to have a say. Uh, you find out once the rules are issued, uh, and they will kind of apply to you uh, by extension because global finance is international, uh, but it is an idea that is called minilateralism. Uh, the, what we know from the UN system and from the Bretton Woods institutions, so the bank and the fund, these are multilateral institutions, places where all nations get together and decide um, what the world should do. Here, this is minilateralism. There's a small clubs of nations that decide for themselves what they want to do. Very different. And um, the uh, again, the UN and the World Bank, etc. These are places 
that are called intergovernmental organizations because the members of these organizations are nation states. If you look at the board of the IMF, uh, the nations are represented. Some of them have a country director and it is one dollar, one vote. The, at the UN, you know, it is one country, one vote. At the WTO, it's also one country, one vote. But it's always nation states that are members. In a government network, that's not the case. The members of the FSB are actually not uh, nation states. So um, the, for the US, for example, the members, the ones who represent the US are three people. One, the treasury secretary. So the treasury is the finance ministry of the US government uh, and they send a deputy there. That is an elected person that, that comes from the current administration, right? That is someone selected by the president who has been elected. Uh, the second one is the uh, head of the central bank of the Fed. Um, does, does anyone remember when the last time you elected uh, the governor of the Fed? No, it, it didn't happen. You did not elect that person. Uh, that person was selected uh, by virtue of their professional uh, career, um, you know, how good their publications are, how respected they are in their community, and then they're being confirmed by the Senate. But that's it. You didn't get to elect any of these people. And the third one is um, a representative from um, organizations, regulatory agencies that you might have never heard of, such as the Office of the Controller of the Currency, OCC, or the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC. When you open a bank account, you see a logo at the bottom that says FDIC. That's, that might be the first time you've heard of it. So these people uh, send a representative and that's it, right? So they represent the central bank, they represent the regulatory agency, they do not represent the country. Um, so it's not an intergovernmental organization. It is only the executive branch. There's no Congress person ever allowed in the FSB. Also not in the, in the G20 for that matter. And regulators. So regulators, people and agencies that are selected by merit, by bipartisan commission, not by elections. They also don't, they, they have nothing to do with the electoral cycle. They have different terms that do not respond to any elections and we don't get to, to elect them. And another part that is important is the difference between soft law and hard law. Uh, hard law is the, the law that we know, right? You have, for example, the United Nations gets together and sign um, an agreement on human rights. And then countries sign this, uh, this goes to legislatures and these legislatures ratify it. And only if the national parliament has said, this is a good idea, then uh, it becomes law in the country, right? So you have a double procedure of signing and ratification, and then it becomes law. And if you violate that law, you can get into trouble, right? People can cite you uh, for violating uh, the UN Human Rights Convention of maybe 46 or the Convention for the Childs of the Right of 1989, uh, and this is what UN agencies do, and NGOs to other, other players. None of this happens in the world of finance. Um, there is no such thing as a law on banking at the global level. All you have is guidelines and recommendations. So these are you know, principles, 25 principles and guidelines and rules that would make sense to use. And what countries do, what these members of the FSB do, they say, we unilaterally pledge to accept and adhere to these standards, but that's it, we're not gonna sign anything. There is no agreement and we cannot be held uh, against if we, if we violate those rules. And so you might ask, you know, imagine you do, instead of, of you know, abiding by laws um, and if you if you violate a law like you're going to get in trouble right if, if you uh, uh, divide for example the WTO makes international agreements and these are international trade law uh, but in finance that is not the case so you might ask why would anyone care if these are not nothing but unilateral pledges what happens if you violate those rules you said I'm, I promise I'll do it and then you don't do it what happens? From a legal perspective, nothing happens. So why would anyone behave? Why would there be the compliance at an international level? And the answer to this, and this is a question that you know is really 
uh, has preoccupied many of us who study global economic governance is a thing called peer review. What does peer review mean? Peer review means that, um, for example, every five years, um, uh, the FSB has decided to review the uh, financial rules for its members. So for example, in let's say 2024, uh, the US financial system will be reviewed. What that means is that regulators from the central banks of India, China, Singapore, Netherlands, and Brazil get together and look at the American rules. And they write a report and they say the US uh, rules meet the international standards here and here, and they don't meet it there. And what you see is something that looks like this. There is an, this is a, like a traffic light system. When the domestic rules are in line, compliant with international standards, you get a green uh, square. If you are implementing and trying to uh, change your rules so that they will one day meet international standards, you get yellow. If your rules are more lax than the international standards, or if you have done nothing to implement them, you get a red box. That is the worst that can happen to you. You get a red box on a piece of paper um, in, a, in an FSP publication. And you might wonder, okay, but this, this is what matters a lot. So if you, for example, if you do a peer review, and for example, the Mexican, uh, the Mexican banking system, you see this, is found non-compliant uh, regarding uh, large exposures. Um, that looks bad. Uh, and that looks bad for a couple of reasons. You are the central banker or the finance minister, and you meet your colleagues, and you're the only one who hasn't done their homework. Right? And everyone knows because these, these uh, reports are public. That is pretty shameful from a, perspective, a professional perspective. And the financial regulators will go to great lengths to avoid that red square when they meet their colleagues the next time. So there's one uh, thing that has to do with reputation in your professional network. And there's a second part and that is specific to finance and that has to do with uh, safety. So if you look at this, you could say, if you invest money in the Mexican banking system, we cannot quite guarantee that the rules are safe and that you get your money back. And just saying that in the financial press could mean that millions or trillions of dollars of investment are not going to go to Mexico. So this can have real life consequences uh, because if someone says, um, you know, the, the, the system of this country is actually not supervised well and does not adhere to prudential rules, the safety rules. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is a dangerous place to invest. That alone can have massive consequences. So that's all it takes. You don't need any law. You don't need any punishment. All you need is one red square, right? So if you think about it, of how money and power play together in one sheet of paper, that's, that's a pretty, I find this pretty fascinating. This is pretty, you know, this is not something that I, that I come across in many other areas of international relations. Um, if Russia invades Ukraine tomorrow and someone said, oh, you get a red square in terms of violating country sovereignty, guess what Putin is going to say? <laughs> Nothing, right? Like, obviously, in the UN, we, I don't know if you, you talk about much uh, about the UN, but they have a veto. Um, uh, power in the UN Security Council. So the UN Security Council cannot condemn Russia. So Russia can basically do whatever they want. Um, but if you look, for example, at Russia, Russia is obviously part of the G20 and the Russian Central Bank is a member of the FSB together with the Russian Finance Ministry and the regulator, and they are doing great. They're like, they're in the middle of implementation, but most of the things that matter, they are doing well and they're cooperating with everyone else because they are worried that their reputation is on the line in the world of financial regulators. Very different world. And so from there, going to uh, like a bigger question of how does global governance work and what does it tell us about uh, the difference between, like why do these uh, shadowy networks like the FSB matter? Um, I'm trying to develop a theory that, that looks at this. Um, it's kind of three stages. Uh, the Weberian nation state, that is a concept that we know from sociology. Weber is a, is a famous German sociologist 
who understood that uh, the modern nation state is a bureaucracy and has three branches, the executive, uh, the legislative and the judicial, that is you know, how states have operated in modern times. And there is like this line in the middle, which is clearly uh, a border. And so these states are separate from each other. That's how it used to be. If you think of a nation state in 1900, that's exactly what it looks like. Uh, since the 1950s, 60s, it started in the 30s, but like let's say from the 50s, 60s, we see the emergence of regulatory agencies, something like the OCC, something like the FDIC, um, something like the, um, um, the Prudential Regulatory Agency, PRA, in the UK, um, you know, and, and increased powers uh, of central banks uh, across the world that are not part of the executive, they're not part of the legislative, and they're also not part of the judicial branch. So they create their, their, their own part uh, that have, um, that are at arm's length away from party politics, from any kind of election. And these are specialists uh, that are really created to be at a distance from the political process. Um, and then what you see is that in recent years, and this has really just started in the 1980s, this is a 40 year old process, it's not new, it's not old, um, that you see that regulators and parts of the executive branch meet, right? This is this like semi-transparent government network here. So you have members of the central bank, the Chinese central bankers and the US central bankers, they meet on a bi-yearly basis. They have a really good relationship. They meet in Basel uh, and they talk about financial regulation and risk. You know, they're really good friends. Whereas the presidents of, of these two countries are in the shouting match about who is the better, what is the better political system and, and who should rule the world. Um, in this world of financial governance, uh, they are removed from all of this. Uh, they are able to work together on very specific things that have to do with uh, money laundering. How do we keep our banks at bay to make sure that there's no money laundering? How can we make sure that there's no next financial crisis, right? And so we have um, a, a conversation that is going on among these regulators and among finance ministry officials that no Congress person, no parliamentarian is part of, no judge is invited and no uh, parts of the other executive. There's no um, minister for social um, uh, affairs invited, no health ministers invited, right? Like this is really just part of the executive, but there's government networks for uh, health minist ministries too. There's government networks for um, uh, agricultural ministries where from every country you have a representative from the agricultural ministry and they meet and all they talk about is agriculture, right? These are not the international summits you get to see ever in the news. These are all below the radar, but these are the ones that run the world uh, in the 21st century, in global economic governance, right? So this is, this is the interesting part. And what you see here is that regulators and executives are international. They talk to their peers abroad. They are engaged in regulatory diplomacies. Legislators, parliamentarians are not invited and they don't like this. Why? Because if the rules of, of the economy are set in these government networks, they will say, well, we are the ones that are elected to make the rules. How come you don't invite us? Who are these unaccountable people in faraway lands? And I'm literally citing a, a, a Republican congressman uh, who called it um, uh, unaccountable bureaucrats in foreign lands. And there is a lot of commotion in different parliamentary systems in US Congress, in the European Parliament, where they say, we don't want to hear, we don't want to just rubber stamp and implement what they, the decisions they make elsewhere. We are the elected uh, officials and we should set the rules and no one should tell us what to do. And so we have uh, a tension between these government networks that are transnational and the state, the old nation state that has a clear border and that has clear systems of representation, accountability and election. And what I've looked here is how this plays out in the G20 process, uh, the agenda setting phase is the first one and the G20 did all of this. This is not at the state level, this is the network level. This is really just, you know, leaders meeting, no implement, like no agreement, no law, 
the G20 is not an international organization. It doesn't exist. It's a group of uh, state leaders that meet whenever they want to, right? They never, they never sign any agreement. All they do is make one um, communique. They, they say four or five pages and they pledge unilaterally to adhere to this, but that's all there is. And then you, you can trace this to negotiation, implementation, monitoring, and enforcement. And to cut this short, you know, to, to not bore you too much, um, the ones that have worked are the ones that are run by international, by transnational government networks, such as the Basel Committee. The ones that have failed to take root and to work are the ones where legislators got involved. Uh, for example, in OTC derivatives. Uh, Congress has made their own rules, the European Parliament has made their own rules, and they don't match because legislators don't talk to each other, regulators talk to each other. So when the central banks meet behind uh, um, closed doors, they manage to actually have uh, a system that works and that has cross-border consistency. When legislators are involved, uh, things are inconsistent, and you know, financial system operators, bankers, etc., can exploit the differences between different countries to uh, engage in risky but very profitable activities that are probably going to cause an financial crisis. That's the elevator version of, of my book. Um, we can also see this in trade. Um, uh, usually when you think of trade, it is a question of uh, rules um, and laws. WTO members have signed up uh, to certain uh, trade rules and they need to abide by them. Uh, there's tariffs you know, that make imports more expensive uh, and therefore protect the domestic economy. But uh, these tariffs, and these are like import taxes, that's a tariff, uh, import taxes are relatively small in comparison to regulatory costs. The WTO negotiates tariffs, but regulators negotiate regulatory costs. And that has to do with a uh, safety standard, uh, food standard, phytosanitary standards, they're called, um, electrical safety standards, uh, all of these things, right? These are in the hands of regulators, not in the hand of, of trade negotiators, but they're much more important uh, than the tariffs. And so again, here you have a question between intergovernmental, the WTO, uh, trade representatives meet, one represents all uh, of India, one represents all uh, of Brazil, versus transgovernmental, where you have um, the Agricultural Safety Commission or the FDA, right, meeting the European equivalent for medicine safety. And they talk just about, you know, the safety of medical products. That is transgovernmental. They don't represent their own country, they just represent their own agency. Uh, and you have a difference between trade negotiators who are good at horse trading. It's like, I'm gonna give you market access here if you give me market access there, versus regulators who say like, we need to make sure there's safety. What are the safety procedures? This is also the difference between bargaining, which is what trade negoti negotiators do, and arguing. Um, so like who has more scientific um, evidence to justify a certain rule? That is what regulators do. They, they're not negotiating or bargaining in the way trade negotiators do. And from a political PE sense here for political economy, um, it is a question is, is regulation used uh, for protectionist means? So is it actually, you, you pretend to say we will just wanna have a safe uh, market, but really, in, really, uh, in reality, you want to protect your domestic industries. And we see this now happening with, uh, with carbon taxes um, in Europe, for example, where European policymakers say, we want uh, to uh, put, impose a tax uh, on um, steel, for example, that is made with coal, and we only, uh, we will uh, do this because we want we care for a green planet. That's one argument. You could also say no. They want to protect a European steel industry because it's more expensive to produce steel uh, that is uh, has less carbon emissions, and uh, they want to protect their domestic industries. So where does it go? That's a question, right? Like someone has to figure that out. It's it's not going to be me. So um, this goes back to global standard setting, government networks, and again, no ratification legislators and anyone that you elect has no nothing to say uh, and has no uh, voice at the table 
in how these rules are set because there's no such thing as ratification. And that means something for transparency and accountability, right? This is an ongoing discussion. Are these organizations, these government networks legitimate? Are they allowed to, to do the things that they're doing? Um, I see here, Kunal said uh, sanctions. Sanctions are, are uh, interesting. Um, Kunal, do you want to elaborate? Quickly, this is an interesting well, you know, when you are When you were discussing about financial regulations, I thought we can answer in the chat. Yeah, so financial sanctions exist, right? And like, uh, you'll see this once, once Putin takes over Ukraine, there will be a lot of sanctions. Uh, both in the in the trade realm and in the financial realm, the the assets, all these like multi million dollar um, homes of the Russian friends, uh, oligarchs, and, and other high level friends uh, of Putin will be frozen. They will not be able to make payments, cross border payments. Maybe their bank accounts will be frozen. All of these things that's going to happen, and so you can see how regulation is not independent from politics. You know, like the financial regulatory system can be used for state purposes and it can be used to punish um, individual countries. But that is um, the extreme case. In most cases, uh, nations behave just because of reputation, reputational purposes and, and to look good uh, uh, within their peers. But yeah, those sanctions exist for sure. Um, so the question, here's a question of voice and representation. What you see here uh, is um, the um, central building of the Bank of International Settlements, which is the central bank of central banks. This is where the FSB is housed. This is also where the Basel Committee is housed, all the other standard setting bodies. It's this very mm, 80s building. You know, everything is beige inside um, and like high security, um, but this is where, you know, uh, when, you, when you wonder uh, where Chinese and uh, American state officials meet, this is the place where they meet twice a year and more often in different committees. This is where international relations happens and no one has ever seen this building, right? Like we all know the, the, the skyscraper of the, of the United Nations and the United Nations General Assembly with their green marble. No one has ever looked at this building, but this is, this is where the rules of global finance are, are being set. Um, so I, I invite you, go to Basel when you have the chance, uh, you know, try to find a way to, to, to get in and, and knock at their doors. Um, it's, it's an interesting experience. But who is, who is a member? If you've already seen it, it's 24 uh, jurisdictions. It's the central bankers, financial regulators, finance ministers from 24 jurisdictions, not more. Uh, there's legitimate questions about who, where, what happens to the G174, right? The G20 is clear. That's the 20 nations that rule the economy. Who listens to the G174, which is the rest of the world? We know that that is a question. And so there's two answers that the FSB has for this. One is um, whenever they make a rule, that is a proposal first. And that means they publish a proposed rule and everyone, literally everyone can respond to this. And I've looked at a lot of these requests for comments things. Sometimes it's um, lobby organizations, sometimes it is um, individual banks. And sometimes it's literally just individuals who have looked at this and who have their own opinion about it. And all of these comments are published and they're taken into account. Um, that's one. And then the second part is uh, the so-called regional consultative groups. So if you look at this um, list here, this is uh, the regional consultative group for Asia. There's six regional consultative groups and um, it includes members such as Australia, members of the FSB, Australia, China, Hong Kong, India, but also non-members uh, such as Brunei, Cambodia, Thailand, uh, Sri Lanka, etc. So this is the moment when non-members can sit together with members and talk. Um, again, all of this happens behind closed doors. We don't know if there's really any, how the information goes. My impression from the research that I've done is it goes from the FSB to the non-members. If the non-members have a problem with it, the FSB is not going to listen. So the communication goes one way, not both ways. But this is 
a, a way where the FSB has reacted to criticism and has said, okay, we're gonna do some outreach. Um, and the final element here is we see now that financial regulation um, is connected to climate change. And you see this at financial stability, that climate change and environmental degradation has an effect uh, of, on financial stability, but that also um, vulnerable groups are key um, to making and taking into account the situation that vulnerable groups find themselves in is key to making um, to addressing climate change. There's been a lot of um, um, initial policy proposals that are made by the elite, you know, rich people in rich countries of how to reduce the subsidies of fossil fuels uh, or of how to, you know, go about a green economy by punishing brown um, economy activities, any kind, any kind of things that, that creates um, global um, greenhouse emissions. And what you've seen is uh, people rebelling against it. Uh, you know, I think you might have seen the so-called Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Wests, uh, who set fire to the Champs-Élysées a couple of years ago. And these were, you know, not the Tesla driving elite that, that is like very, can, can be green pretty easily. It is working class people who need to drive uh, to work every day because they can't afford to live in the center of the city. They can't, they, they don't have access to public transport. Uh, it is people who, in other countries, who rely on subsidies for fuel uh, to cook, to, to do the work they're doing. And so if uh, financial regulators um, don't take into account um, these vulnerable groups, it will create social inequity and tensions. It will make um, their life worse for uh, poor people that are already affected by climate change. And so taking this into account, and this is what is called a just transition uh, to a resilient and environmental sustainable economy, taking into account everyone is really important um, because it is the only way to really uh, address climate change, but it's only the only way to uh, not create resistance to green policies that will help us address climate change. So regulators have a lot of work to do in there. And the interesting thing again is this is an area where we see the rest of the world in tension, right? Like if you look at, at the news every day, uh, personally, and I'm like, you know, all, I, all I'm doing, all I'm interested in is international relations from like on a professional level and from a level of having lived in many countries and having friends from many countries. The world is not looking great right now. There is a lot of shouting matches. There is a lot of tension. Um, people are not into talking to each other at an international level. I don't, I don't see much movement forward in cooperation. Um, we see a lot of tension. The, the bells of the drums of war are being, you know, drummed right now. But we see some cooperation in these like very narrow technical fields. So Chinese financial policy is very green and European financial policymakers are learning from Chinese financial policymakers and how to encourage green loans and green bonds. Uh, you know, you can see how the Brazilian central bank is working together with the European central bank on making a climate aware central bank policy. You'll not see this in the news. This is not, this is not gonna make the headlines because, well, for whatever reason, uh, but there are signs of cooperation that don't happen at the general diplomatic level, but in regulatory diplomacy, specialists in finance, in trade, in other areas that are getting together across borders to figure out what is best for their area of expertise. And if there's, in my personal opinion, and hopefully this will happen with AI, hopefully this will happen uh, in other fields of uh, techno regulation that is gonna come up over the next decades uh, that will save us from some major wars and from some major uh, tension at the international level. So if there's, a, if there's a shimmer of hope in this world, I think it is there. And with that, uh, we've come to the end. Um, I think uh, Ray uh, and Ryan, uh, please let me know, like, let me stop sharing here. Um, we can, I think, move straight into Q&A and into office hours.
right? Is this? Yes. Um, this so I'm in charge of the transition into the Q&A. And I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Knack, for that amazing presentation. It's actually really cool to see because I was there during the Paris protests. So um, it was really cool to see that real world connection. So now we can open questions. As you can see, a lot of people have been raising their hands. So we can start with Noah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Professor, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, out of your Saturday to come and speak to all of us today. So I had a quick question that you touched you touched on a little bit a couple of minutes ago and a little bit when you're talking about the tensions in the world right now. So if Russia was to invade Ukraine, um, what would be the effect on their own place in the global economy and also organizations such as the uh, FSB? I think the short answer to this is none. <laughs> The, the, the Russian Central Bank is a highly respected organization that does everything right when it comes to following the rules, implementation global, implementing global standards and keeping the financial system safe. Um, even the Financial Action Task Force, the, the ones that are in charge of money laundering, the head of the international money la anti-money laundering organization is Russian. And they are like some of the best specialists in the area. So it has nothing to do with the military folks do. Uh, which is fascinating. And, you know, like, for example, Trump, the Trump administration has, you know, burned uh, international relations and diplomacy left and right. You know what they've done at the FSB? Nothing. They have continued to follow the rules. They are like some of the best members at the FSB. Nothing has changed as if uh, the, the elected government didn't matter. So don't expect any changes if Russia goes to war in these uh, small areas of uh, government networks and specific cooperation. But it's a great question. Great, thank you so much. All right, Gunal. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, before I start, Professor, I have to say this was the most interesting and engaging lecture we had till now. Uh, thank you. I primarily have two questions. So uh, you told that in your book, you touch up uh, uh, touch a bit on why this is a bit unknown to the general public. So could you tell us a bit also about that? Why um, this topic is not really um, known? Like why a lot of people don't know about the FSB and things like that. And also my second question is, um, what, what drives your uh, view that um, like the legislature and the executive are not uh, intertwined with, um, you know, financial regulatory bodies? Because I've seen, uh, I'm from India and like in the past six years, the chairman of the Reserve Bank of India stepped down twice because he did not agree with the executive. And um, I recently saw the um, hearing of the uh, like election to the Federal Board of Governors in the US. And um, during the hearing, like the, a lot of like Congress, uh, Congress members were just asking the nominees about how their politics won't affect um, regulation and you know, it was a, it was a really political discussion when I saw it. So I I don't see, understand how like you say that it doesn't affect it, but when I've seen like it does seem to have an effect. Like politics do seem to have an effect on regulation. So could you explain that? Yeah, the, those are two both very interesting questions. Uh, to the first one, the FSB is not famous because it's so technical. You know, if you talk about uh, capital adequacy ratios and the leverage ratio as compiled by, you know, different uh, non-banking financial institutions, you can put someone to sleep within a minute, right? This is boring for most people. So that's, that's one of the reasons why you will not see it in the mainstream press. Um, most people are just not interested in this. Um, the, to your second point, where is that? I have that book here. Um, so, Yes, politics does influence uh, regulation. And the Indian case is interesting because it's one of the few cases where a central bank governor has actually sat down. Um, uh, that, that happens in other countries too, where the central bank isn't as independent. Um, but um, it certainly is the case that regulators have a lot of impact on, on politics. Uh, what what the kind of financial rules that are made have a huge impact on politics. And that is why uh, legislators are so furious that they don't have a seat at the table and that uh, the unelected officials are not uh, listening to them. Um, and so there's there's been a really good book uh, that is called Unelected Power. And it talks about uh, central bankers. Um, so in, in many countries, 
central banks and financial regulators are one step removed from the political process. If you're a president or a prime minister, you can't just fire uh, your uh, central bank governor. You can make life really terrible for them, but you can't fire them. Um, but it is a big tension and it goes back to a bigger question of democracy. Who are these central bankers um, accountable to? Who elected them? What, what is, is, this, is this a democracy? And the answer is no. And I come to a difficult conclusion in my work that exactly because they are not accountable to elected officials, that is why they can work together across borders. Because humans, citizens, think nationally. They don't care what happens in other countries and they're uh, parochial. They have a very limited time horizon and a very limited geographic horizon. That's a problem for global governance. So there's a difficult tension. You know, I'm not, I'm not against democracy. I'm very much, I will fight for democracy, at least in the countries where I live in the West. I have no opinion about democracy in other countries. That is other countries' questions. Um, but there is a tension between elect, electoral accountability, having a four year horizon in a given country and global governance. You, you sometimes need people that are one step removed and that are experts in their fields in order to make global governance work. So it's not an, it's not an easy question. That is one, you know, that will be debated in, in all countries for the, for the you know, years to come, especially if government networks, these unaccountable networks gain power vis-a-vis -vis parliaments in the world, which I think is, is going to happen. Thank you. All right, Edith. Hello, um, thank you for speaking with us today um, and for this um, very informational lecture. So I just have two questions. So one of them is, is there politics involved in the FSB peer review and how do, regardless if there is or isn't, how do they prevent political influence and allegiance from affecting FSB peer review? Um, and then my second one is how does a relatively underlying organization um, influence on a global level? So how does it relate to the power money theme that you have been discussing in this lecture? So yeah. Can you, can you repeat the second question, please? Okay, so the second question was, um, how does a relatively underlying organization, so from a like knowledge standpoint, how not a lot of people know about this organization, um, and also just um, influence on a global level. And given that, you know, uh, power money is a theme that has been um, discussed um, majorly, uh, mainly in this um, lecture, how does that relate to, or does it relate to the power money theme? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So peer review. I find peer review fascinating because when you look, for example, you know, um, you would think that um, if you have a couple of, you know, Dutch regulators or American regulators looking at the Chinese financial system, they will come in as Dutch regulators, right? like a Dutch people or Americans. Uh, but if you look at the peer reviews, they're not. The, the, the peer reviews, you have literally a group of, you know, a Russian representative, a Singaporean representative, an American representative, and they all mm, debate about the merits of rule number 25.8 in the appendix of the financial banking code of that country. So they are just nerds, you know, they're going deep down one rabbit hole and all they talk about is not about how this benefits my country, but is this safe? Uh, from the point of view of financial stability that we all agree on, because we all went to the same universities and we all studied financial economics in the same way. So there's something that uh, political scientists call epistemic community that is independent of where we're from, we agree on certain things. And that has to do with, you know, efficient market hypothesis, mathematics, you know, things that we all agree on and that it doesn't matter whether you're from Singapore or from Australia or from, from Brazil. We all, above all, we are central bankers and financial economists. And these are the conversations that reign supreme in this world, which is interesting. You know, you wouldn't, you don't, you can't expect this in other areas, even in the area of financial, of, of environmental discussions, right? You, you, it's not that everyone above all is an environmentalist. People might be 
um, you know, Brazilian first or Argentinian first and secondary. They think too much about their, their national industry and not about the, the greater good. And in the, in the world of, of these peer reviews, it is really them being specialists first and members of a certain nation second. That said, money and power does play a role. And I've looked much about it. The political economy literature looks a lot at banking lobbies. So you have these giant organizations, for example, the Institute of International Finance, IIF, all the big banks in the world are members of this. So you have Nomura Bank, Credit Suisse, and uh, Chase, JP Morgan Chase. They all give money to this organization. These are well-resourced uh, people in suits, and they meet at the FSB. Like, and who is interested they have in mind? The ones of the banks. And so there's been a lot of work on regulatory capture, uh, meaning that individual banking, individual lobby interests influence the rules uh, of the people that are supposed to rein them in. And I've looked at this, I've talked to people at the IIF, at all, all the big lobby, are my, these are some of my favorite people. You know, it's like, it's always great to talk to the advocate of the devil, you know, just like you bankers have ruined the world and like, let me talk to you to see what you think about the rules. Fascinating folks, you know, they always dress well, uh, and they're, I think they're, they're pretty evil, uh, but they're, they're very sophisticated. Uh, but what I found in, in my research, at least in, in, in this very specific area that I've looked at, is that the regulators take their notion into account, but they don't follow their advice. There is, they have enough individual um, research background and, and their own data capabilities to issue rules that the lobby organizations are not happy with. So my first hypothesis in my work was the biggest problem is uh, lobby influence. It turns out empirically speaking, in, in my case of, of the global financial regulatory reform, this was not the case, but that doesn't mean that it could be the case in another area. So be aware of the lobbies, but it doesn't mean that they always get their way. Okay, thank you. All right, so as we go to our next question, just a reminder, um, we have until 1.30 EST. So for the remaining um, participants, please limit your question to just one question. All right, so Fayaz Hassan. Yeah. Um, professor, um, thank you so much for this lecture. It was really interesting. And also um, just, uh, I apologize if my audio is a little uh, wacky today. It's been acting up a little. Um, my question was mainly about um, when you were discussing like the soft laws, um, I thought, that was like really interesting considering like it's only like guidelines and regulations so i thought if you are kind of allowed to be flexible with these guidelines and the fact that you know they don't have state uh, nation state members and in these like global financial discussions is this what allows a monopoly of, of of dominance of like big world powers that we see today over like smaller countries and what role does the I, imf play in all this or whether the fsb has more influence than them maybe Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll also thank you. This is a great question. And I'll also try to keep my answers short to make sure that everyone has a chance uh, to ask questions. Um, the IMF plays a role. They work together with the FSB in country review. So they go in, it's called Article 4 consultations, and the IMF does look at whether the financial system is well regulated. And this is when soft power turns into hard power. A little bit because if the FN, IMF disapproves of a country's regulation, that means they will not get loans from the World Bank, they will not get loans from the IMF, and that can have real financial consequences. So the soft power can turn into the hard power when they work with the IMF. Um, and yes, it is a couple of small countries, well, it is a small number of very powerful countries uh, that uh, sit in these mini lateral organizations. And they rule not only the, the, the global standard setting bodies, but they also rule the global economy. It is an unjust and uneven distribution of power, both in terms of who sets the rules, but also who runs the global economy. If you're Burkina Faso, you don't have a seat at the table, but your banks also don't matter for the global financial system. So you can talk, this is a worthy discussion, is this a just distribution of power? Uh, or is it, does it just represent the in unequal distribution of power that we see in the global economy in the first place, where the G174 really don't matter as much. If that's good or bad is a different question, but you see an unequal distribution of power for sure. Thank you so much. 
Okay, Ivan. Hello, thank you for taking your time from your Saturday to give us this lecture. It was very interesting. I just wanted to ask if there are any readings you could recommend on the history of the FSB? Yeah, um, there is a book that is called um, The Status Quo, uh, The Status Quo Crisis. The status, let me put it in the, um, um, this is by Eric Helliner, who is a, like a wonderful person. Um, the status quo crisis. Helliner is the is the author. That would be the first book to to consult on this. Thank you. All right, Kanak. Thank you for the lecture. And so I wanted to know, do all the countries get a peer review? Because as you mentioned that FR, uh, FSB follows the policy of uh, minilateralism and considering that the only thread they maintain the global policies is the unilateral pledge they make, which is of course based on their reputation. Uh, but the countries which are not are being represented, re represented in the committee, uh, what drives them to follow the policies which are essentially made by the members of the FSB and uh, what uh, if they are not even being reviewed why do why would they follow the policies in the first place this is a really good question um the um the peer review only is among members so only the 24 review each other but that also means that the big wigs such as the US Europe and China are subject to scrutiny so the US subjects itself to peer review by the other countries, that doesn't happen elsewhere. You know, you don't have an assessment of the US military by someone else. You don't have this in, 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 in other areas. So this means a lot. You usually, the, the great powers don't like to be reviewed, but they subject themselves to that and they're doing it every five years. The countries that are not members of the FSB, why do they care about the global rules? Well, it has to do with, you know, the, the question that, was, that we just had before, the uneven distribution of power. For example, anti-money laundering. Um, if you are, um, there's rules that, that a few countries have said, this, this is how we do uh, anti-money laundering. Um, and everyone who is not following these rules is considered a dangerous jurisdiction. So if you are Tunisia or if you're Pakistan, for example, um, and British banks will say, I don't know if I want to work with a Pakistani bank because they might be subject to money laundering and they might not have the rules in place. What that means is that your banking system is cut off from international finance. And it's not a state decision. It's not that someone high up said, we will exclude uh, Pakistan from the international banking system or Tunisia or you know, any other country. It is uh, that the banks say, oh, we might uh, you know, face scrutiny from our home regulators, so we'd rather, no, rather not do business with them. And what that creates is a race to be sometimes what is called more, more to be more holy than the Pope. Uh, you can find many countries that are not part of the FSB that implement rules that are more strict than they should be just to look good in the eyes of the few uh, banks that run the world, Chinese, Japanese, uh, European American banks. That's why these rules are implemented way beyond the group of countries that make that choose them. Thank you. All right, Eric. Uh, thank you, Professor, for speaking with us and taking the time out of your Saturday. I had a quick question about the idea of unimplemented rules in global economic governance. So I was wondering what happens to the majority of them? Are they and like discarded? Uh, some of them never get implemented. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking at them um, in, in, in the, the, the book, um, you know, like some of these things actually don't move forward. And that in the cases that I've looked at, it often has to do with legislators. They're saying like, we're not gonna take orders from you. We don't think this is good for our country. We're not gonna make any changes. And so sometimes they get stuck. Um, even in countries that are at the center uh, of the global financial system. For example, uh, Basel III banking rules 
are not implemented, are not, the European Union is not compliant uh, with Basel rules, which is fascinating because the European Commission was part in making the rules at the global level in, at the Basel Committee, but then European parliamentarians came in and they said, no, we weren't asked, we don't think this is good for the organizations that pay us, this is not good for small businesses, we're not going to implement those. And that's where it's at. So some of these rules are really not being implemented, and that has to do with the tension between regulators on the one side and legislators on the other. Okay, thank you. Pratik? Um, uh, hello, Professor. It was a great lecture and I really liked it. And so I had one question. Do you think that uh, the UN or like the G20 would be more uh, influ like small, like, like a close knit group of countries or like an inner, like a wide, like 190 plus countries organization, like the UN is more uh, influential and influencing each of the countries there? Yeah, and that's such a good question. I asked exactly that question my master's students on Tuesday. Uh, and I asked him, you know, if you were to create a, an organization to, to uh, control global finance, what would you do? Would you do another UN agency with 190 members or would you make a club of 20? And you have to be good to be part of that club. And you know what? All of them said, we're going to make a small club because the big organizations in economic governance, not in human rights, you know, not in environmental questions, in, in economic governance, the WTO hasn't gotten anything done since you were born, basically, you know, like, and even longer. Since 1994, the WTO hasn't made any agreement. Um, other organizations that are very big are being held up by the sheer number of their members and the disagreement. Uh, that has happened. So the organizations that are really making progress are small ones, such as the G20, such as the, the FSB. Is that fair? Is everyone represented? No. Uh, do they provide the public goods that help the rest of the world, the rest of the economy? Yes. So there is a really difficult tension between effectiveness and representation. The organizations that are not representative are more effective than the ones that are very representative but don't get anything done these days. So we see a move away from the really broad universal organizations of the 20th century towards minilateralism in the 21st century. Thank you so much. All right, Upanita. Thank you, Professor, for such an amazing lecture. So my question is like countries like China focus more on uh, financing, the like climate financing, uh, on green bonds, etc. But developing countries like India, we have really less focus on such kind of financing, uh, like on climate financing and other issues uh, which pertain to climate change, etc. And as a matter of fact, we have also seen there's there's been evidence and research papers where we find where we find out that like impact of, for example, uh, financing on the climate climate or like using renewable energy, for example, has uh, as a result shown a negative correlation on the GDP as compared to the United States. So Professor, like how do uh, countries like India like focus on uh, creating a more sustainable and greener economy when such uh, obstructions come into the way? And you could say, um, and this is this is a question I'm literally engaged in this. I'm also working for a Swiss think tank that tries to uh, influence central bankers to think green. So when the political system is not willing to go green because brown industries, you know, like carbon emitting industries are very powerful because they hold the purse of the politicians, you know, because there's lobby influence. There's many reasons to not be green from a politician's perspective. Then sometimes, um, the best way to change this is through regulators, if you can influence regulators, if you can show, for example, that um, um, uh, carbon assets, carbon heavy assets are risky, because it, uh, they will, um, uh, companies, you know, coal, coal powered companies, 
in the future will face more taxes and they will have um, they will actually their their future income stream is actually not that safe. And so what a central bank can then say is these are risky assets and you need to put up more capital as a bank if you want to lend uh, to these carbon emitting industries. So there is an organization called the NGFS, the Network for Greening the Financial System. It started with about 10 central banks. I think there's now 70. And again, this is a government network. And I don't know if the RBI is, is part of it, but they might. Uh, a lot of other uh, central banks, the Chinese central bank is part of it, for example. And they're talking about how they can change financial regulation to move the economy uh, to a greener system. So sometimes it is through those regulatory conversations uh, that uh, a bigger policy shift can be undertaken than by the very, in the face of people, you know, uh, mediated parts. So maybe there's hope in how government networks can make the world greener. Thank you, Professor. All right, so then we'll go Alexander, Faiza, and Zulal, and that'll be all our questions we take for today. Hi, Professor, thank you so much for speaking to us today. Um, my question is, when looking at like the peer reviews, do you think that like the role of the government in the economy affects how a country scores on like a peer review? How the economy uh, does affect how a country is doing the peer review? Like, um, do countries that have more active governments in the economy score better or worse than like countries that have like less government involvement in the economy? Ah, okay. Um, so like state involvement, the interventionist versus the liberal uh, economies. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, uh, maybe surprisingly, no. Um, you, you have uh, highly interventionist uh, countries like, like China uh, that are doing great, but then you have other countries with equally uh, high impact of the state in the economy that are not doing well. Um, and conversely, you have you know, a market economy like the US um, that has actually impl implemented all the rules, but then the European Union hasn't. And they're both on the liberal side. If you look at the G20, they're both on the liberal side of it. So no, they're looking, they're really, they're not looking at to, to the extent to which the economy is doing, but really whether they're the regulators, whether the state implements the rules or not. Um, okay. So it's really a work of the governments. Okay, thank you so much. Hi, so my quick question is, do you think the rise of cryptocurrencies pose a risk or a threat to the FSBs? And if the central banks come up with their own digital currencies, will it contribute to the global financial stability? And this is the talk, the talk of the talk yeah. right now in Basel. Um, among regulators and it's fascinating this is like one of the things that I'm, I'm looking at right now um central bankers are were not amused when facebook came up with libra it didn't fly well and and facebook did a terrible job at convincing regulators that it's a good idea they failed they did they had there were some tech bros you know there were people who thought they they ruled the world and that you know with their six digit salaries in san francisco can convince central bankers that they have the future in their hands and central bankers were like, no, no, we're not going to let this happen. We have the power over currency. And that means a lot of how we can steer the economy, of how we can keep the financial system and the real economy safe and stable to the extent that we can do this. We're not going to let this slip out of our hands. Um, and they shut it down, basically. Um, you know, Bitcoin is illegal in China now, uh, and it will be in a, in a bunch of other countries. Um, the uh, cryptocurrencies have um, an important area. They're actually called crypto assets and are called cryptocurrencies in regulatory speak. And what that means is the currency is something that you can use to pay people with. A crypto asset is something where you can stow away money, like gold, uh, like paintings, you know, whatever, whatever else you want to use as investment. So regulators uh, have decided no. We you can you can use this crypto assets. You do whatever you want to do with crypto assets. It's not going to be a currency because we do currencies and no one else does. And they're doing digital currencies in order to move into that area because it will give them.
only control the, the money flow, the, the monetary supply, but they can also look into transactions. So if you are a shady uh, operator and you want to send you know, $100 million to your favorite terrorist organization, um, they will see what you're doing. And right now, if you send it in cash, they will not. And that raises a lot of concerns. Like, do we want uh, central bankers to be so powerful? Is that actually a good thing? Do we want to give away cash? Like the, the privacy that comes with cash, that is a raging debate, but it's not. So cryptocurrencies have been kicked out of that, uh, that area exactly because um, regulators don't want to reduce the power and the sovereignty that they have over the monetary system. Thank you. Hello, so thank you for this great, le great lecture. Actually, my question will be specialized on Turkey. When you mentioned the FSB peer review, Turkey directly called my attention since, you know, I'm Turkish. Mm -hmm. So my question is, do you think that Turkey's inner economic situation affected the country in terms of implementing these reforms or having uh, yellow marks on the list? Yeah, and Turkey is interesting because, you know, I mean, there's a lot of trouble with the, with the central bank. The central bank governors have been kicked out. There's, you know, the, the, the monetary policy is, is in trouble in Turkey right now when it comes to financial regulation, prudential regulation. Again, Turkey is doing fine. I think it is like green on, on most of the areas. It has not been an issue. Uh, I don't know when the last peer review was, but in terms of financial regulatory implementation, Turkey is golden no problem so it is, it is an interesting way right like you see the world going and being on fire even in economic terms sometimes but then in this very narrow field of prudential regulation keeping the financial system safe uh, and the banking system safe and asset management system safe turkey is doing fine russia is doing fine china is doing fine brazil is doing fine they're all it, the us is doing it. they're all good and, and happily peacefully working together yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so that will be all the questions we have today. That was a really good Q&A period. We learned a lot about multiple countries. So everyone can put their hands down. We won't be any, we won't be taking any more questions.